need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, now that he knows Ted Lasso season two is going to be Jason Sudeikis' blood on the tracks. He's all in. It's Andy Greenwald. I mean, I know we got to, we got to, first of all, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, man. I, can I do it? Chris, just, by the way, just got multiple takes for that intro. Can I get multiple takes for my reaction? Sure. Can, yeah, I, mean, I would love to just engage with you about like d- just the most important news of the day, which is Olivia Wilde apparently is now dating Harry Styles. Do it for the portmanteau. Wilde Styles is the <laughs> <right>. only good <laughs> Couple yes. name yes. that I've ever heard. I'm glad that this is the fo- this is this podcast will focus on the important things in 2021, including upcoming TV shows. Right? We're going to talk about what we did on the break. I'm walking you into this. Do we still have to do this thing where we take a break before we talk? You did it. I'm walking you into it. We'll be right back after this. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July, I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. What's up, man? I see you're you're still supporting. Uh, you're in the pocket of Big T. You look great. I think your hair looks longer. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a minute, but it's really lovely to start another year with you. 2021, here we go. Thanks, Chris. You know, um, happy Clean new year slate. to you. It's great to see you. I, I only do three things now, just so you know and our listeners know, okay? I go running. I grow increasingly white hair out of my head. And I watch movies. So get ready for that. That's going to happen. I know. Andy's pivoting to cinema. Today on the pod, we're going to do uh, what we did on our winter vacation, basically. So we'll talk a little bit about um, Wonder Woman 84, any of the sort of entertainment news that we may have missed uh, in the gap of recording. Uh, I encourage people to go back and listen to those last couple of episodes that we did because there were a lot of fun with Jason Mansukis and Sam Esmail and then our year-end mailbag. Uh, and then the rest of the show today will be the shows of 2021 that we are looking forward to. I put together a little bit of a list here for me and Andy to go through. And I think, well, let's let's get started with what we did over the break, man. So I, I, I know that you're itching to tell me about the just full pivot you made to cinema. I mean, I look, y- you know that there are a few things that I hate more in life than proving Sean Fennessy right. But look, when you're right, you're right. It turns out movies are good. Movies are a great way to spend your time. I really enjoy them. And I could do this the joking way, which I probably will keep falling back on. But in all seriousness, the highlight of the break, which, you know, doesn't really involve uh, travel or seeing family anymore <laughs> in this current circumstance, was taking like 10 days off of television and just spending every night at the uh, at the old Cinemaplex, a.k.a. the living room couch. Right. Driving, and, driving to Flagstaff, Arizona. Yes. <laughs> where? <laughs> uh, and, and yes, any state where the economy is open and just supporting the local vendors. Um, no, but it was really, really... Uh, this might be other people's every day. I mean, I know this is Sean's every day, and I know you watch a lot more movies than I do, but I, I, I was really struck by how much pleasure I took and almost, like, edification I got from just taking a trip, sometimes to a different time period or a different place in the world, in a contained creative statement every night that sure. left me, uh, you know, made me, made me think, made me feel things. 
And it wasn't that strange mix that has, you know, that, that really fuels the podcast and fuels our our life because it's kind of mimicked in Twitter and social media and everything of the anxiety of there having to be more. You have to catch up. You have to keep going. You have to push forward. You have to resolve the story. The, you know, the, the cliffhanger can kind of infect your life, especially yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was something about the closed statement that I that I really enjoyed. And so, and also part of the fun for me was also texting my boy CR about what <laughs> the cinema club had, in, had, in, had kind of messed around with the night before. And, you know, I think that I surprised you. Sure. Because I think that the idea of me as someone who doesn't watch movies and only goes on planes, well, <laughs> that, no one does that anymore. But, the, you know, the, the, the idea that, 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 that the most emotional turmoil I can handle in a day is a episode of Bluey <laughs> is maybe, maybe that became a bit that started to like leach into my real life. Sure. And in fact, I can, I can watch some big boy entertainments and that you were a little nervous about me handling. Uh, well, no, I think that I just, it, it was, I honestly think it's sort of sweet. I have to be completely sincere. I don't think I've ever seen someone take to a streaming service mm. with the just dewy eyed, mm. tender adoration that you ha- feel for the Criterion channel. It is, God, I love it, it. it is amazing. And I, I'm, I fully support it. I think it's really interesting to hear your thoughts on some of the stuff that you may have missed over the years or some of the stuff that maybe you just skipped over growing up and stuff like that. And it is really like a remarkable, remarkable resource for people who haven't done it. I mean, I, I really suggest taking the plunge. It's it's just yeah. astonishing what they have on there. Yeah, and I would say full service wise for people out there for the Daddingtons and Mommingtons, there's great kid content. There's a great movie that my family, whole family enjoyed called The Railway Children from 1970. There's a movie what, called Criterion Lovers and Lollipops on Criterion. Yeah, they have Saturday matinee. They have kids content or all ages family content, which is great. They have, it's you know, it's possible to do things like, oh, I love Mike Lee movies, but I never saw Life is Sweet. So we just mm-hmm. watched it. And I was like, that. how did I miss that? How great that that's there for me. Or Terrence Malick's Badlands, which I had never seen, did not realize that it invented Wes Anderson. Fascinating great to see. But also they just, you know, they they do interesting things like, oh, okay, here's some melancholy holiday movies for December for no reason whatsoever. Yeah, they had a 70s uh, horror thing going for a while there that was really good. I mean, they still have the collection up. It's really, the, some of their some of their collections are really good. And, and, and make for very fun projects, especially at a time when it seems like we are not just home, but we might be home for a little bit longer than we expected. So like, I've never dealt with these, the cinema of the French director Bertrand Tavernier. Watched a movie last night, Chris, called A Week's Vacation. Kind of a masterpiece. So loved all that. And I really recommended it a lot. And I, and I think that it brought me, I mean, you guys will be the judge of it. But it kind of mellowed me out and calmed me, I think, for the year and culture ahead, which we're going to be getting oh, into. Oh, so you're saying that this has been like almost a palate cleanser for you. Yes. I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm moving off of it. But I'm saying that there was something about the rhythms of pressure-free rhythms of like, this could be an interesting experience tonight and it will be a closed circuit experience tonight. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I I think that we have often talked and we pissed off Sam Esmail by talking about it and we made it into the gray lady herself this weekend for talking about it and the New York Times for talking about passive viewing. And obviously that got kind of twisted because really we were talking about playoff baseball and Sam <laughs> thought we were talking about shows we would rather not have our eyes on while they're streaming. Yeah, I like but, being in the other room while this is on. But, but regardless of that, I think that we have culturally slipped into a sense of like, well, what are we watching now? Like, what's mm-hmm. this week's watch? And, and you know, whether it was something that we we're like really engaged in um, or something that that like my wife and I were sort of, and are still passive watching this is the different definition of it, like Borgen. Like, it's in our pocket. We enjoy it. We'll throw it on. There was something, that it's actually not passive in the way that I've been looking for because I do feel that pressure to like keep going. Uh, mm-hmm. Whether it's to keep going with an extra episode before bedtime or like, it seems like something good is going to happen once we push through it and we get there in the next few days. The thing about the movies that I was enjoying, and I know this sounds like super basic, but it did have an effect over a period of days of like, that chapter is closed and now we'll open up a new one tomorrow. We can go in a different direction, whether it's in terms of country of origin or genre or whatever. That's really cool. I mean, I think that there's been a little bit, it's interesting that this happened at this time. Obviously you had in some ways a little bit of time off, but, and, and as, as we all probably sort of did, and obviously also 
nothing to do with that time off, to, so to speak. But I think there's been a little bit of a gap. So Bridgerton came out. I think that was sort of like, com- that dropped right sort of as we were doing our year-end episodes. And um, other than that, like I, so I watched a few episodes of Bridgerton, which I think is fun, but not really like, I don't really have anything to say about it. It's just, it's just kind of like, it's just zany. And uh, I, I don't even know if I like dislike it. I just don't, it's just like on and I'll like kind of look is, up every once in a while while my wife is watching it. But I, that's a, the, the only new thing I've watched. Other is it Shonda Rhimes, Jane Austen? Is that kind of the vibe? Basically, yeah. Okay. And then the other thing that I was watching was this thing on the show on Amazon called The Wilds, which is a really interesting experiment in what it would have been been like what 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 could have been for like network television had network television continued to pursue dramas this is about uh, a group of teenage high school girls who are stranded on an island that they think is near hawaii and find out that they are maybe, maybe, i guess it's b- best to leave like not too much revealed but they they just find out that no, nothing is what it seems on this island um after this this what? plane crash yeah how could you so spoil it essentially that for me? is like lost meets my so-called life, I guess. By the way, the real, the real passive viewing experience would be a show about a plane crash on an island where literally everything is exactly yeah. As this, it seems. Like we just did crash into a plane. <laughs> we just crashed our plane. Um, but those are the two shows I watch. And then for the most part, you know, like I, I found that myself like as soon as the, the sort of the podcasting cycle ended, that was sort of right when Wonder Woman dropped, and mm-hmm. I felt. As soon as I heard like the early reports on Wonder Woman, as soon as I listened to the big picture, as soon as a couple of people had texted and said like what they thought about it, I was like, I'm just in no hurry to do this. I, yeah. Now I, I think I think listeners of the pod will know. I don't really like think I, I am like the world's foremost expert on DC at all. Like I'm I kind of like acknowledge its existence and fine to talk about it, but could not really say with any certainty what's going on at any given time in any of those movies. And also, I, I just think that they're generally pretty bad. I'm not knocking anybody who likes them, but like, I don't care about Suicide Squad. I, I'm i kind of like done, I think, with any Joker movies for a while. Um, I'm excited for the Matt Reeves Batman because of Matt Reeves, not because of Batman and wanting to see another Batman movie. And then as far as Wonder Woman goes, like, I thought the first one was fun. Uh... Watching the second one though was was pretty, uh, it was it was pretty nonsensical. I thought. I, yeah, I want to talk about this, uh, and and I was the one that that urged you to to engage because listen, people know if anybody in this podcast likes to tap out, it's me. But I wanted to tap in for a variety of reasons. One, first and foremost, being I did enjoy the first one quite a bit. It surprised me how much I enjoyed it. Two, really loved the marketing. Great posters. For Wonder Woman 84. Terrific. Yeah. Great color palette. Nice design. Good stuff. And three, you know, again, shout out to Sean and Amanda, the big picture. I was interested to see what it would feel like to see a blockbuster in the wrong way. Uh um, And what might be the only way going forward. So I fired it up with some some trepidation, but also some level of excitement. And I should also say a lot of caveats ready to, to flow. Like I definitely, from the beginning, tried to question my own reactions, wondering if it would play different if I had, was in the arc light or if I, was a, if I had already had too much popcorn during the trailers, you know, or if this was a, a night out. Or what a what out happens or the, when you have too much popcorn? Is that like feeding Dolby. a gremlin after midnight or something? Or No, I, that was a shout out to you because often... Back in the days when we would do things socially, if we ever went to a movie, you'd be like, I got to I gotta say no on the popcorn because your boy's got a sensitive tum-tum. Right? No, it's like not you, even that. It's just that I feel like I just like spoil dinner if I have like a whole bucket yes. of popcorn. Yeah, of course. But yeah. I, what, for, I, I was saying more the thing of like, are you a popcorn rationer during the trailers? Oh, yeah. No, I, I think that like when you get snacks, it's not like a two hour. It, I, I think you should try and crush your snacks like as soon as you sit down. I, I like to have, like, if if the popcorn bucket is a well poured uh, beer, I like to have the head still. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't like too much lip from the, the sure. bag showing when the movie starts. <laughs> I like to focus. Yeah, I'm really fun to go out with. By the way, um, so all of that was in my head, 
And my jaw is still on the floor because I can't believe what a misfire this movie was on nearly every level. And it makes me question so many things. Really? Frankly. So this was like, so, so this, this many upset things. you. It didn't upset me. I just, I, I'm totally stunned by it. And on so many levels. One, if you want to, you know, we often try to take like the macro corporate view of it. And I think going into this, we were like, you know, as much as one can feel sympathy for corporations, I was like, what a what a bad look for Warner Brothers, who who has one thing that is unambiguously working for them in their DCU stuff, which is this Wonder Woman, this nascent Wonder Woman franchise. And then it gets kicked out of theaters and it gets delayed. Obviously, this isn't one that they are trying to hide or that they are running from. I no longer think that is true. Like you think that to, this is almost weirdly a, a dump. Well, maybe they could have hit it in the summertime and, and they definitely did a good job showing it to five people who all of whom should be in the witness protection program who were like, five stars, no notes. What a thrill ride. <laughs> like, I don't know. I assume they just rented IMAX theaters for these people and then like also gave them, you know, CBD <laughs> Sprite yeah. because it's just, I don't, I don't understand. There's a special but like, new it, flavored sprinkle on their popcorn. <laughs> But just, just on a, you know, and, and again, don't, I don't want to be the guy. I would love, I would welcome different feedback here. I don't want to Superman explain how this ought to have been done. But this fundamental idea that Wonder Woman, as a hero to build a movie around, needs to be A, the most boring thing in the movie, B, a combination of stick in the mud and nun, who, despite her enormous powers and kinky skill set, and, you know, uh, various toys that she plays with spent 70 plus years pining over her first boyfriend while working in the basement of a museum. And when they're like, do you go to parties? She's like, I would never go to a party. Dude, go to a party. You're fucking Wonder Woman. You know what I mean? Like you have a lasso of truth. It's okay. You can move on now. And then when you get the opportunity to have any wish in the world, because, and we're getting to this, Chris, and I'm sorry, this is a spoiler, but I don't think people who have not seen the movie and hear this will believe me. I think yeah, they will I know. still go That's the, the thing movie. is that when you start to try to explain the plot of this movie, it's the, just like, yeah, but what's it like? What's what really happens in the movie? The movie is about a magic stone that grants wishes yeah. and she wishes for her boyfriend back. Yep. But he comes back in some other dude's face and body. No yeah, reason, by the what's way. What's up with that? All I didn't understand other wishes. That. I, I've never been this confused in a major... I mean, these studio movies are so shaped and raked over and refined to avoid any possible confusion. That this, that the fact that this... Because that guy looks like Timothy Oliphant's stunt double. You know yes, what I mean? And, like, then she, and then he's like, this is what I look like now. And she's like, but I only see you. Uh, and so then we only see him too. But other people see someone else. Like it's fucking Freaky Friday or whatever. But all of this is, if you make the wish, the wish stone seems to get what you want, right? Like when the dude is like, I wish for a giant wall to divide my country into refugees and true believers. The stone, at this point in the form of Pedro Pascal, is like, bet, and builds a fucking wall in the yeah. middle of a country. But when Wonder Woman is like, I want my boyfriend back, they're like, mm, got some caveats. Right. Got some, got some asterisks. Yeah. Z -z 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 -z. You know what I mean? Yes. It's so insane. And then they get in an airplane and they're like, let's fly to Cairo in a jet for 15 hours. I just, how did this happen, Chris? We've spent a lot of the last part of 2020 talking about, analyzing, and in some ways, caping up for the precision and the planning and the learning from mistakes that have happened right. over in Plusville with... Mm -hmm. Marvel and Star Wars. And we we did that emergency pod reacting to all the Star Wars shows. We talked about all the Marvel shows that are coming. We talked about how the Mandalorian positioned itself at the center of the Star Wars storytelling universe. And now all these things will blossom out of that. And hopefully actually like take what Favreau and Filoni did so well with the Mandalorian and be like, this is how people can understand it if you tell the story like this. It doesn't have to be this busy everybody's running in and out of things and and a million MacGuffins piled on each other and constant resets and reimaginings and retelling of origin stories. Like you can actually push out and push up with your storytelling. It doesn't always have to be rowing in place. 
So that was the thing that I was thinking about most when I was watching Wonder Woman 84 was how hysterical and it, it, it literally is like watching a movie made by blind chickens. Like, I don't even know like what, what, and, and, and the, the sort of like, Hey, DC's just going to throw everything at the wall and there might be two or three Batmans and two or three Jokers and mm-hmm. we're making everything so that we can make an HBO Max spinoff of it. But then there will be some unification down the road. And the, the guy who runs DC now, who did the interview with Brooke Barnes and the times being like, I am I am here to tell you that there is Earth One and Earth Two and that the DC universe will comprise two different realities, but no movies have like actually come out to explain that yet. It's like a dude dropped a memo for us. I'm just like, dude, like honestly, like you guys are probably just gonna make a billion dollars per movie anyway, so feel free. But like for some reason, like the the entire everything from like the way the movies look to the way the people perform in them to what they are about misses the target for me with DC. So I am just like a uh passive bystander on this well, one. Well, look, I, I think that though we may be khaki-clad middle-aged basics now, roughly the same age as Kaya's parents, there was a time when we were, you know, we liked punk rock music. We liked the DIY aesthetic. We used to buy Guided by Voices 7 Inches and be like, this is make, better you, because you it's making wild it sound and pure. so much like, uh, like Matt from A Teacher right now. Like the dude's... <laughs> We made it sound like we're just playing guitar we, in the living room being like, we used to tour the Pacific Northwest. We used to crash <laughs> airplanes on islands and figure stuff out, man. Uh, so, which All of which is to say that I think on some gut level, we appreciate a company taking the different approach from Disney's methodical, first order-like regimentation of how they're managing their properties, right? Like there is something appealing about chaos. But Warner Brothers remains committed to the Rudy Giuliani legal team strategy of flooding the zone with would-be Krakens and just letting the chips fall where they may. Yeah. That was the feeling of this movie that can't even seem to make a coherent argument for why they're making a Wonder Woman movie at all or who Wonder Woman is. Like... She should have something that makes her distinctive, but she has a golden lasso. She just runs around like Spider Man. I, I don't like the visually it was incoherent. I don't understand what the point is. She's hiding who she is, but sneaking into malls to rescue kids. I, Chris, what are we doing? I, it, it's just it's just crazy to me. I don't know. It's I mean, very I think your, bizarre. Your point being about like it was unfortunate that this happened to this movie that it got put in this position of streaming. But that then maybe that this was kind of like a blessing in disguise and that this movie is essentially like it gets to be both under the spotlight and quietly moved off the stage so that they can just come back and make the third one and do whatever they need to do. And whether that's I mean, Patty they were Jenkins. real quick to be like, we're making another one with Patty Jenkins, which was interesting because I actually thought- I have actually found the entire, the Patty Jenkins of it all to be pretty interesting. I mean, she went on yes. Marin today and she was basically like, it's been very difficult to make these movies over the years, you know, and that- she and she when the, the second one came out, she was like, I do not know if I'm coming back for the third one, although I do have a story for it. Then there was an announcement shortly after Christmas Wait, was weekend. His follow up, do you have a story for the second one? Could we <laughs> add it in post? <laughs> and then there was a story after this was you know, Wonder Woman eighty four was released that she that they were like, they are going to complete the intended theatrical trilogy. Gal and, and Patty are are back. And so I, I found the the entire kind of behind the scenes stuff around Wonder Woman certainly more interesting than what's happening on screen. Look, every time one of these movies comes around, we 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 do rehearse some of the same dance steps about our own uh, prejudices or ignorance about DC in general. And I, I'll just reiterate to say like yes, I was always a Marvel guy, so I always was looking at these movies with some degree of skepticism or just without that built-in fandom. But something that I think has always been very true about DC versus Marvel is just being played out, which is because the DC characters, the iconic characters are older and they come from an older storytelling model, they are essentially gods. It is top-down storytelling. And because they are omnipotent gods, they are often the least interesting character in their own narratives. I mean, even Batman, who gets a pass because he's, you know, mortal, literally, even though he always wins, and gets a pass because he's dark, sociopathic, and cool, Joker, his villains are more interesting than he is most right. of the time. And I think that's the case 
with these these stories too. And they haven't really figured out a way to fix that. And in fact, no one has for DC characters, I think, since Richard Donner and Christopher Reeve, who made Superman goofy, you know, in an appealing way. So what do, where, do you put Nolan in, where do you put the Nolan movies in this then? I don't, I mean, I think Batman has Almost carved ex- out its own lane. It exists in its, on its own, yeah. It kind of does. I I, th- I think the, with Wonder Woman, it's just like, well, we are championing something here, but we're not quite sure what it is. And I, I don't, I think the, the, the allure of the most powerful person on the screen being a woman has faded in this movie when she's also just deathly boring. Like, I don't know why people want to hang out with her because she's not that interesting, which which is really a problem. And I don't even mean that as a criticism of the performance. I just mean that the, the thing designed around her. And so now we, we are entering into this world where, yeah, as you, you alluded to that time story, which I think is interesting, which is basically saying, like Disney with Marvel and with Star Wars, we're flooding the zone with this stuff. Like, sure. there's just going to be a ton of it. And so, okay, some of it might be good. Some of it might be interesting. but it it is interest it, it it remains notable to me that 10 years deep into i think almost 10 years after we we started the podcast 9 years ago this month right pretty early on i think we started making jokes about warner brothers cinematic release schedule that was leaked or or, or announced proudly during a comic con a while ago, which was basically like untitled DC project, untitled DC project, untitled DC project sure. for the next decade. I think we've been talking, we've mentioned the Flash movie in some capacity for almost the entirety of our podcast run. Listen, there you could have a spirited debate whether we need any of this. And you could have a spirited debate whether like the second Ant-Man movie or the second Thor movie was important <laughs> or had something to say. But I just think it's notable that this many years into trying to compete and make the cinematic universe, that opening document is still the most compelling thing that Warner Brothers has offered as to why they're doing it, which is to fill their release schedule. Speaking of release schedules, Andy and I are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about the shows that we're looking forward to in 2021. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Greenwald, we're back. And so is TV. Well, actually, not yet. One of the funny things about going through this list of 2021 TV shows that we're, we're going to talk about here is I can't tell when anything is coming out. <laughs> um, there is essentially WandaVision comes out January 15th. Sure, we'll have a lot of fun with that. But then after that is just a lot of TBD 2021. Now, we had kind of, I think, been a little bit alarmed when lockdown first started happening and a couple of things started moving off of August and moving off of September releases. And you had shows like Succession and Stranger Things, which we'll talk about in a second, delayed and moving into next year or now this year. But for the most part, we had a very nice uninterrupted run of there always being something on, at least something that you and I liked. And at times, two to three things. And now I think we are at the first time, and this will change on the 15th, I guess, with WandaVision, but this is the first time in a while where I'm like, oh, there's not really a lot for us to be talking about or watching uh, that's on. Now, we have this whole long list, but I wanted to start with asking your take about the pipeline and the Mm -hmm. state of it. I think it is more in flux than at any point since March, you know, and it reflects everyone's own total confusion and terror and panic about the state of the pandemic. I think that many shows, obviously many shows have were able to return to production. Many shows seem to have threaded the needle and sort of got through it, especially if they were finishing out a season by getting back to work in August, September, October before things started to get very bad again. But I think a lot of shows used the extra time to plan to be their best selves in the new year. Right. Specifically this month, January 2021, assuming that someone 
in America would have figured this out by now. Sure. That is obviously not the case. And because the global epicenter of the outbreak is now Los Angeles, which is also the global epicenter of the entertainment business, nobody knows what's going on. I, I There was a request. A requ- <laughs> the fact that we're still saying yeah. request from... Uh, the, the county, right? From the county and from the governor being like, maybe don't go back to production, even though you guys are, we've, we've acknowledged that you're an essential business. That actually got more traction than I expected. Disney, among other companies, announced that they would delay resumption of production on a number of things for two weeks. Not sure what difference that's going to make because that should tee up really nicely with the Christmas travel hit. Mm-hmm. Um, but so everything is already delayed again. And then also just anecdotally talking to friends and colleagues and, and people at studios who have been working very working on things that have managed to go into production, everything has been delayed. And, and, and not just delayed, I'm sorry. Everything has been shut down. We have heard about some of the shutdowns, like you'll see on Deadline or Variety, this yeah. movie, Got um, this TV show gets shut down for two weeks because of a small outbreak, hopefully a small one, or a positive test. Many of the projects that have been publicly identified as shutting down temporarily have resumed production and then shut down again. And the second one hasn't been publicized. Right. So, you know, it's gnarly. It's super gnarly. Everyone making stuff is miserable. They feel very fortunate to be doing it. But all of this is to say, we wish that we would be starting this year off on a brighter note being like, well, Succession, a show that you and I just can't wait to have back in our lives, is scheduled to be back in production this month. I'm not even sure. Maybe they started um, in a soft way last month because they had been prepping for a while. Can we confidently say that it's going to be back on our screens late summer, fall? I don't know if we can confidently say it. I know. I mean, I, 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 so many of the shows that I put on this list for us here were in production and got shut down due to the pandemic, have resumed production, and now have a TBD release date. So... That is a blanket statement to say that we don't know when any of this stuff is coming. And also, I've been thinking about this a lot because obviously I've been doing the NBA show on Fridays now for us, The Answer. So I've been watching a ton of basketball this year, like more than probably the last season. And you can just tell that there's like just weird shit going on. You know what I mean? Like we we watch basketball. I watch Premier League soccer. We watch flight attendant, stuff like that. And we're like evaluating it as if it's happening against something that was also happening in 1998 and 2007 or something like that. This is not the same thing. We are not making things or doing things under the same circumstances. And I don't know necessarily how much use there is in constantly pointing that out. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, you just kind of kind of be like, did flight attendant make sense or did I find it entertaining regardless of the circumstances under which it was made? And the same thing goes for are the Hawks good or not, depending <laughs> regardless of whether or not there's anybody in the stadium. But to not acknowledge the fact that there is just these extraordinary contextual circumstances around what we're watching on a daily basis on our screen, I think would be an error. And I'm very, very curious to see what, how does that impact Hawkeye? How does that impact the book of Boba Fett or Succession Season 3 or any of these shows that we're talking about? Now, some of this stuff I think is pretty much done. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious about that. I, I think it goes relatively unremarked upon, you know, and um, it's not like you and I spent a lot of time on the flight attendant anyway, but had we done so, I wonder how much of it would have been like, this really seemed like something they maybe inserted because they didn't have coverage of a plot point that they wanted to do. Or I, there was, there's definitely elements of that show that, that seemed like that. And I really I mean, like the flight attendant. I, I, I felt like that show existed because someone got the wish stone from Wonder Woman 84 <laughs> and, and misused it. I didn't, I didn't quite get it at all, but yeah, I, I, I think the first thing I, I just want to say is that like, and this is probably true for every business. It, it's true for the NBA. It's definitely true for the valiant, you know, selfless, crushing work that small restaurants are doing just to stay open with no guidance and no help. People are doing incredible work. Like, and speaking specifically to TV and film production, like people's entire careers have changed, you know, or, or roles have changed. It Being a line producer was always really, really hard. You're basically in charge of everything that happens every day and the budget for it. Now you are also um, 
an amateur epidemiologist. Yeah, the you COVID know. safety coordinator. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's just unspeakably challenging, and we can debate whether doing that is essential or not. We can debate whether it would be we would be better off if someone just paid them to just not do it for a month. But since they are doing it under these impossible circumstances, I think it's kind of amazing. So I don't want to make it seem like, you know, we're 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 going to ding the results or that yeah um, yeah yeah or or that it's somehow not not worthy of our attention or or celebration. Like people are working so hard to keep themselves and their crews, especially employed and getting paychecks during this incredibly difficult time. But I, I yeah, I have no idea what the result will be. And and I think the thing you said first is probably the, the smartest thing, which is it's just not the same. Like Succession season three, hopefully is great and hopefully is very special. I don't know. I just keep harping on that because I'm excited about it. And also because it kind of seems uniquely suited to vibe on this moment, whether it, no matter how directly it deals with the pandemic, but it, it, it feels almost unfair to compare it to season two. And it also, I should say, feels almost unfair to compare it to something like the Star Wars shows you're mentioning, which are yeah. uniquely well suited because they can to shoot be them produced. in a warehouse somewhere. They, they, they can keep the actual on the day production crew at a bare minimum because the majority of the work is done later in post, mm-hmm. in which you can do in small rooms or you could probably do remotely. They don't go on location. You know, and just the headache of location, especially for a show, I'll say it again, Succession, like, you know, which leapfrogs across Europe on a good season or normal season. I can't, I can't imagine. We, we don't know what we're getting, yeah. but we should, we should go through the list because not yeah. only do we not know what we're getting uh, in terms of things that we are expecting and looking forward to, we should note that going into last year, so much of what ended up on our top tens I don't know if they were on our radar. Yeah, not at all. I mean, I, I think that I had been excited about normal people. I had been, you know, I, I, I had never heard, I don't think I'd really heard of Michaela Cole before last year. You know, we hadn't heard of Mickey Down and Conrad K. We hadn't heard of so many yeah. people who made stuff last year that was so exciting. So let's just talk briefly about the returning champs for yeah. us. And these are shows that we typically have either discussed a lot or obviously are very passionate about. Shows that we're expecting to come back in 2021 are Ozark, Stranger Things. Stranger Things, were that was in production, I think, when they shut down. And at least the word out of kind of the Stranger Things gossip community to the extent that there is one is that this might actually be not good for Stranger Things, but like it was beneficial for the writing of the season, which I think the last two seasons, it was suggested that they were still writing the show as they were shooting it. And that this is the first time since season one that they have written the entire season as they were making it. So they have like a kind of better idea. I think especially season three felt a little jarring in that way. You know what I mean? It felt like they were kind of writing it as they were doing it. Anecdotally, I heard much the same thing. I mean, the production was just kind of chaotic because they had a ton of expectations, a ton of uh, cash, a lot of cast. And then also um, Netflix doesn't usually do this, but that is one of the tent poles that it builds its year around. And they want to hit certain holiday benchmarks and they want to have it there for you. And that that's tough for anyone. Yeah, it's like to, July Fourth weekend, or you know, mm-hmm. they 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 build it around the holidays when they know people are going to be home. So Ozark, Stranger Things for Netflix, Succession, and Barry. And, and Ozark is in production. Ozark is in production in Atlanta right now. And this is the final season of Ozark, so expect it to be even more bloody and, and crazy than before. <laughs> Chill, yeah. Succession mm-hmm. and Barry come back on HBO, and Ted Lasso. I just thought I would mention just because. Absolutely iconic Ted Lasso Newsday. And also because obviously I think as the year end stuff happened, I I would say that it clearly has one of the biggest fan bases of any current television show. Well, let's let's go one by one. I I just want to jump on Barry, which is just to say Barry. Barry is a very, very popular show Mm -hmm. that people love talking about and get so excited about when it's on. And just vanished in the pandemic, right? Like they were, I think I read that they had done a table read for the season premiere uh, in February or March. And then it just, that was it. Um, Supposed to get going again, um, I believe this month. And we'll see. I miss that show. Very eager to have it back. The Ted Lasso thing. Was it odd also that they, were they getting in front of this Olivia Wilde, Harry Styles news when they announced that they are not only bringing the show back for a third season, but they are ending it? Uh, Was that weird? I think it's 
I, I don't want to spoil anything for anyone, and I know that this is not Star Wars. First of all, like if they get to season three of Ted Lasso and people still want more Ted Lasso, I bet they could figure out a way to keep that show going in some way, whether it's Ted Lasso comes back to the wait, States and wait, takes wait, over the Kansas City. What are you going to say here? At the, end, at the end of season one, is he diagnosed with cancer and he has no. two years to live? What? So at the end of season one, his club is relegated out of the Premier League. Whoa. There is a very obvious trajectory for this uh, story yeah. if you have followed the Premier League over the last like six or seven years of of kind of do you believe in miracles type stories that I think you could easily see Ted Lasso follow. And it would be really cool if they did it. It would be really smart. Um, so Ted Lasso comes back and they haven't renewed that for season three. I, I just thought that was an interesting thing for Apple to do to get in front of the news about its unquestioned most pop unquestionably it's most popular show yeah uh and announce early that it's going to stop that just felt very like late period netflix and i guess that's just sort of current period tech company streaming entertainment yeah and, yeah and you know behind the scenes there's always reasons for this like maybe jason sudeikis doesn't want to spend his year in the country that made one direction popular i get it <laughs> but <laughs> It also was just surprising to me because, as yeah. you said, it's a, it's a comedy. Like, it could keep going. They could take a year or two off. They could, as you said, they could move him to this country. Why do you announce that it's ending, even if Sudeikis and Bill Lawrence plan to be done then? It, that, that surprised me. Yeah, that is interesting. So then there's the Marvel shows, WandaVision, Falcon and Winter Soldier, uh, Hawkeye, Loki, and Miss Marvel. We're expecting this year. Star Wars, so far, I think we know Book of Boba Fett. We're assuming Mandalorian Season 3 comes out in December. And then... There's two massive Amazon tentpole shows. Uh, there's Wheel of Time with Rosman Pike and obviously Lord of the Rings. The details on Lord of the Rings are relatively scarce, except that it takes place in the, the second age, which I don't know anything about. Yeah, just tell, um, me what the, tell me what that is, challenge. <laughs> and then uh, Wheel of Time, I have not read. Have you read those books? No. Okay, mm -hmm. so those are coming. And those will be pretty big deals, I would imagine. And then we get into the, the watch shit here. And I know that this is an odd thing to start with. And I think it's actually um, pretty, you know, it's a crapshoot as to whether we see this this year. But I, I'm going to throw out a, a show that I am unreasonably excited about. Okay. <laughs> Halo. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dude, Tell me why you're excited Because Pablo about Schreiber it. and Bokeem Woodbine are good. They are really, really good actors. Mm -hmm. And I used to play Halo a lot. Listen, and I'm just a guy going to the supermarket and I see the Kraft Mac and cheese and I say those are two flavors that go together, the Mac and the cheese. <laughs> Mac, the Mac has no flavor. <laughs> That's right. The cheese comes through. You know what I mean? You're just saying you're a guy who likes cheese. Yeah, that's okay. okay. <laughs> but then that's like, I'm just saying that I, I think it's possibly because of Fargo, possibly because of Den of Thieves, possibly right. because I remember smoking Camel Lights and playing Halo. I mean, those are some of the best times of our lives. I, I, I am with I, you on I'm that. I'm just not, not excited for this. I guess I'm excited for a couple of reasons. I think Pablo Schreiber is an action star. Well, what's interesting about it to me, first of all, Charlie Murphy is in it too. I know. Do you want to mention that? Um, this is one of those projects that has been around for so long and then you're kind of shocked that it actually happened. Like this started, I think, was going to be the launch show for the Xbox channel because Microsoft was going to get into the content game. And then weren't there stories, didn't we talk about this in the podcast, of people dressed as the Master Chief walking into network boardrooms as part of the pitch with like a giant gun? <laughs> That's just sort of a weird <laughs> Simpler approach. times. Yeah. And then it falls to Showtime who, you know... Immediately we, gives we it a seven-season order. Well... We have both praised and dinged Showtime for how they've managed their assets, but pretty canny about a lot of things, including being like, okay, we have to have we have to have some skin in each of the games that are active. Yeah. Right? They they are not a service or network or whatever we're calling them now that can afford to be just one thing. So they very smartly, I think under under David Nevins and his leadership team, like just they walk, you help me with this because I, I, you know, I'm not a gambler, but like walked around the casino and put some money down on almost every table B because to say like they knew they needed a Game of Thrones type show and they chose this one, which is the weirdest one possible. And we should add the other thing that keeps it kind of interesting, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that it was developed 
by the first guest I ever had on my interview podcast back in like 2012, Kyle Killen. Yeah. Yeah. Who made Lone Star. So and- his his involvement is very intriguing as well. I don't know if he's still involved in the show or not, but you're exactly right. They're walking around and they're placing these little bets. And so one bet is on Halo for the tentpole franchise thing. And then another one is on Ripley, which is essentially the Patricia Highsmith extended universe, I guess. I mean, the thing that really attracts me to this is obviously it's, um, it was made into a very a wonderful movie by Anthony Mihaly years ago, but uh, with Matt Damon and Philip Seymour Hoffman and Jude Law. But this adaptation comes to us from Steve Zalian, who is obviously one of the great screenwriters of the last 30 or 40 years and worked on The Night Of with Richard Price and also stars Andrew Andrew Scott, who I think is a remarkable actor and I'm really excited to see him in in the Ripley role. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's... The other thing that Showtime has done is like with Good Lord Bird, which is a show we liked but kind of moved off of, but Sam, you know, happily celebrated in our year-end show. They're just taking flyers on some interesting shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if the success of Queen's Gambit made them feel good about this bet. Not that they're comparable in uh, tone, but Steve Zalian, a celebrated screenwriter and director like Scott Frank, a veteran, adapting something that presumably means a lot to him. Uh, with a and thus having both a sturdy roadmap and the credentials and the experience managing the tone of something, mm-hmm. um, it's pretty interesting. So the next thing up we have to talk about is obviously what's I, I am assuming is going to be a pretty monumental event on TV, if you want to call it TV. Now this kind of gets back to what we were talking about with Sam in our year end television uh, pod. But I'm talking about Underground Railroad, which is going to be on Amazon. It's Barry Jenkins' yeah. adaptation of the Colson Whitehead novel. And if you've seen any of the teasers, which I think are probably widely distributed, but I see them, they're on, they seem to be on Vimeo more than anything else. Uh, it, it looks like it's going to be like a really important event, like cinematically, socially, in every way you can kind of possibly imagine. Barry Jenkins is one of our best filmmakers, and he is making an epic story on Amazon, uh, and I, I can't wait to see it. I don't know whether we're going to walk out of that and be like, that was a TV show, or that was a miniseries, or that was a movie, but it looks absolutely jaw-dropping. It's so beautiful, the way you just said we might walk out of something. I would oh, love yeah, to walk right. into something. <laughs> that's right. I'm looking forward to doing that this year. But yeah, I I, I just, I, I co-sign. I can't wait. I Barry Jenkins isn't just one of our most talented filmmakers and one of our most important filmmakers he just is an incredible uh bellwether of taste also i think and not to bring this whole thing full circle but like criterion channel you know as people's like adventures and movie going and you can like the safety brothers list some of their favorite movies um megan abbott friend of the pod whose dare me is on netflix now people should check it out is on there but barry jenkins is on there too and his influences are so beautiful and wide and varied and you know he's just it's rare i don't know why i'm i feel terrible i feel like i'm stepping on sean's toes you know it's like like do you actually feel watches, terrible well yeah i like watches kieslowski once you know what i oh, mean yeah. and then starts starts opining here but like i think it's pretty special when someone who is such a filmmaker's filmmaker also is riding the electric current of the moment yeah. And isn't just, you know, in the academy celebrating things. And so the fact that he feels like his vision or his art is so elastic that he can bring it to television because that's the space he needs to make to adapt this book, this very large book. Cool. This might be the my number one most anticipated of the year. We've got two shows from David E. Kelly this year, uh, which we just enjoyed The Undoing. I think quite a bit at the end of last year. And we've got um, the big ticket one is Nine Perfect Strangers, which is going to be on Hulu and is uh, reunites Kelly with Nicole Kidman. It's directed by Jonathan Levine and it's based on a Leanne Moriarty novel about an Australian spa retreat with a secret. And that obviously has like all the the sort of marquee names. Is Nick doing her accent? Is she just I don't, going I don't on know. that trail? I haven't seen anything about this. I didn't read the book, but that's all mm-hmm. the big little lies kind of pedigree is there with that one. And do then, you think like the do, the do the Yelp reviews of spas in Australia, are they like male and female, like nudity, whatever, smoking or non-smoking, secret or not secret? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, is right. that just like when you're booking your, your facial <laughs> or I love like the idea that you could just put like all these filters on a search for a spa, like 
male nudity smoking. <laughs> I want a smoking. I want a naked men smoking, but I also want a secret <laughs> that is not related to the male nudity or the smoking. Uh, the other show that David e. Kelly has is Anatomy of a Scandal, which stars Sienna Miller, uh, Michelle Dockery, and Rupert Friend uh, of Homeland fame, and uh, that's directed by S.J. Clarkson, who's um, who did Collateral with Carrie Mulligan a few years ago, and. Uh, it follows the ugly media scandal of a political love triangle involving a sexual assault accusation. So not necessarily the most sunny material, but after seeing 21 Bridges a couple of months ago, and much delayed after it came out, I'm pretty into Sienna Miller. Like, I'm really excited to see a Sienna Miller show. So I'm looking forward to Anatomy of a Scandal. A couple other things that we're looking forward to. Um, HBO has this little-known performer named Kate Winslet coming back to the miniseries format with the mayor of East Town, which is about a small town Pennsylvania detective. To be clear, not the mayor. This is mayor. like a rural juror situation. M-A-R-E. The mayor. Yeah. Like 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 Mayor Winningham. Right. And it's um about a small town detective who's working a case while her life is falling apart. Give me all give me all the fucking Kate Winslet playing prime suspect Helen Mirren you got. Give it to me. Yeah. I'm buying we're open 24 7 I will trade in crypto, whatever you got. I want this show. It's directed by Gavin O'Connor, who did Warrior and The Way Back and Pride and Glory. I'm very excited for this. She's one of my favorite performers. And if she wants to play a fucked up cop investigating a crime in small town Pennsylvania, just sell. Sell it, it to me. It, is, is she investigating missing ballots? <laughs> is, 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 that, is that what she's going to find? That's the Fetterman of East Town. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the... Um, what else we got here? Well, okay, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about Station Eleven. Station Eleven is from Patrick Somerville, and it's an adaptation of the Emily St. John Mandel book that uh, was beloved. I didn't get a chance to read it. And is yeah, directed- because we lived it. We yeah. talked about this with Mantzoukas exactly the other day. exactly what like, I would ask. It also features- I have it, yeah. but I didn't read it. Directed by Hiro Murai. I don't know if he directed all the episodes, but I believe no, he, he, he worked on it. he was directing the first few. Okay. And stars Mackenzie Davis and is obviously a, a pandemic movie. It's about a sort of, a, you know, a world killing disease and the aftermath of that. We've chatted about this a little bit, but this is such a unique experience that we're all going through in that I, I've, we've lived through other tumultuous times in our world's history, in our 40 something years and almost any, any case I've been like, I can't wait to see the culture that comes out of this. I can't wait to read the, the fiction that comes out of this moment to see the movies, to see the TV shows. And I, I still just feel nothing when it comes to like wanting to see COVID reflected on screen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's not explicitly, obviously what station 11 is about, but station 11 is going to have that hanging around its neck, whatever it does drop. What do you, what do you think about that idea? Uh, I honestly have no idea. Patrick is a good friend and this has obviously been extremely stressful for everyone. Uh, but this particular circumstance as well has been really challenging for him. They were shut down by their pandemic show was shut down by the pandemic and they have not gone back into production. They had filmed, I think an episode and a half or something in Chicago, um, when they, when they closed down shop in March, they are scheduled to go back this month. I have been in touch with him a little bit over the last few months, but haven't asked because I don't know the material. And I also kind of don't want to know it, you know, just because I'm looking forward to seeing what, what he does with the material. I don't know how this affected the literal piece, you know, whether there was an opportunity to rewrite or, uh, a need to reconceive or reimagine because mm-hmm. a lot of the terms, I'm sure, and a lot of the visuals will either be specifically uh, relevant to people's lives or suggestive in ways that could be good or could be bad. Um, I, I honestly, it, it's, a, it's, it's almost like crushing to think about that. Because yeah. just from a creative point of view, it's hard to have anything shut down in the middle. But to have something that is, it's almost like it, you incepted it into the world and come back to it. I'm, I'm not sure. But regardless of what our year has been, this would have been a project we would have been highlighting anyway, just because we love Patrick. It's exciting. Great cast, great director, um, and a big swing for this, for the service, you know, who, 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 for, this is from HBO Max's, like, this was picked up and put to series, like during HBO Max's first flush with like, we're just making it rain. 
Sure. Like we we are going to go, we're going to grab these big projects that other people want to, and we're going to make, and, and we're going to get noticed for it. And so that these were all supposed to hit, obviously, uh, in 2020 to sort of put them over the top and get them on people's radar. All of that has changed circumstances about every aspect of this project. So it's a question mark, but one worth paying attention to. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about a show that is very important to me already. And um, it's been a while since we visited Taboo Island. And I don't know if I, I feel like Columbus burned his boats. I don't know if we're ever going back. <laughs> I don't know if Tom Hardy's ever going to, you know, find the new world. But in the meantime, I feel like I may have found my fix. And that is Andrew Hayes, The North Water, which should be coming sometime this year uh, on its BBC. So I'm not sure who would pick it up over here. It stars Colin Farrell, Jack O'Connell, and Stephen Graham. And from what I can divine, it is about a murderer on a whaling vessel in the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> and all the pictures of Colin Farrell in this, in this show make it look like he has been living in the woods for 10 years. Great. I'm, I'm ready for Colin to be back in my life. And uh, I love Andrew Hayes' movies, and I, you know, I, I, I'm really looking forward to this. Is this the same Andrew Hay who made Looking? Mm-hmm. And, and what, was the, what was his movie, Weekend? Yep. That's very exciting. I think you're just dropping gems on me. I didn't know anything about this. I'm very interested he in also Colin made, Farrell's... He also made Lean on Pete in 45 years. And Lean on Pete will f- fuck you up. Based on the Willie Vlauten novel. Yeah. A novel recommended wholeheartedly on this podcast by friend of the pod, George Pelicanos, just to bring it full circle. Oh, wow. Let me say, all always all in on Colin Farrell, but particularly laser focused on his 2021 shift towards nautical yeah. material. He, he's hunting whales in this movie. He's the penguin in a yeah. Batman movie. I think, you know, I recently, people know, the uh, Avatar The Last Airbender got a lot of a lot of burn in my house recently. And that's a world in which powers are divided between the four elements. Earth, air, uh, fire, and water. Oh, it was, I thought whales was one of the elements. <laughs> well, I put whales in the water element, unless, unless okay. they're beached. Kind, in which case kind of a mac and cheese situation with those guys. <laughs> it, it's like, you really can't have one without the other. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is, this is Colin's water period. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then we can look forward to him taking classic uh, earth and fire roles. I mean, you can help me out with what those might be. That, the backdraft reboot, perhaps. I almost, um, I almost remade backdraft in my house the other night because I tried you're to... You making mac and cheese? No, I tried to um, make a, uh, a bourbon-based pan sauce. Okay. Oh, and, no. And, and oh. I did didn't really get a lot of the off heat terminology in the recipe and uh yeah did did the fire climb the wall a little bit it might have i got questions um <laughs> how did you extinguish the fire i took it outside and i hosed it i hosed I that hosed is so sauce. much more dramatic <laughs> than i thought i was like i thought you were gonna say like i kept my head on a swivel i took the lid of the pan and i dropped it down on top of it thus quenching the fire didn't didn't think of that uh, what happens okay. when you do that? We, you, you, you choke out the air. The oxygen, right. The oxygen. Right. How much bourbon-based blood did you have after this event to calm down? Oh, I mean, then, like, I, I fully just ate sides and drank all night after that happened. What was, you know, you're, you're not an independent contractor. There's another <laughs> member of your household. Would you like to do a TikTok of her reaction to this entire affair? Not really. Uh, I, th- <laughs> I would say that in in most of the decision crossroad moments that we had in that experience, yeah. where it was like we've arrived at a go left or go right moment, her instincts were right, and I heard her say the words and then did the other thing. You know oh, what I mean? yeah. And it just, a lot of it was like, I was like, intuitively, the bourbon will need to be cooked at some point, right? So I'll turn the flame, the flame's going to cook the bur- bourbon. And I can was I, like, yeah. <laughs> can I ask you, like, what, it, how much time needs to pass from that event before it's funny for you to suggest after you finish a meal? I don't meal, think I'll be cooking with bourbon ever again. Well, I was going to ask, like, at the end of a meal, will you say, would Madame like the Bananas Foster prepared table side this evening? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, I can do that now. She's got a good sense of humor about it. 
Chris is saying that, but he's backing the body language is suggesting <laughs> that he might be going up in smoke. Should he try this again? I love this. Like we can keep going down whatever list of TV you have, but I want to know <laughs> about the real shit. You know what I mean? Like I want to know what goes on when the mics are off. I wanted to ask you about a couple of adaptations before we get going. Cause I, we have, okay. I, I can, I can kind of go through a lot of this, you know, Tokyo vice, the Michael Mann, uh, Tokyo crime show, uh, Dustin Daniel Cretton's directing that pachinko, the adaptation of, of, uh, Minjin Lee's award-winning novel, Gosh, what else? Oh, Severance, the new Ben Stiller show uh, with Adam Scott, Patricia Arquette, Will Ferrell, John Turturro, and Christopher Walken. Sounds kind of Michelle Gondry-ish, but interesting. Not that Michelle Gondry stuff isn't interesting. But uh, a couple of the adaptations here are a long-awaited sort of highbrow graphic novel stuff. Like Mm -hmm. um, Why the Last Man, which has been following a, I wouldn't say tortured, but very arduous uh, road to to screens. Yeah. Uh, Brian K. Vaughn. Another Brian K. Vaughn series is coming to screen. Paper Girls, which uh, Halt and Catch Fires, Christopher Cantwell and Christopher Rogers are helming. And Variant on that. Also, um, I'm kind of interested in this William Gibson adaptation from Lisa Joy and Jonah Nolan, which is starring Chloe Grace Moretz. It's called The Peripheral. And it's basically like a bunch of different timelines. I've not read this book, but um, it sounds kind of along the line of Station Eleven, very prescient to the moment that we're finding ourselves in. That's not exactly, a, obviously, a graphic novel one, but I was curious about some of the genre adaptations that are coming and 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 then that whole industrial complex that we've got. It's interesting. It's hard to separate the projects themselves, which of which we know little specifically, from their development history or the moment that they're being actually going to be released into. Um, Paper Girls, I don't know where they are with the development of it, but that's the, based on the comic book series by Brian K. Vaughn and Cliff Chang. It's fantastic. It's it's really, it's a version of Stranger Things that I would prefer to see. Honestly, it's about four young women who have a paper route, obviously, and then end up traveling through time and dimensions. And it's got a lot of heart and it's got a lot of surprises, but it also is kind of laser focused on those four characters in a way that is really appealing. And you could see how it would lend itself to a show. And Rogers and Cantwell I think are getting a lot of deserved, um, if overdue, praise for Halt and Catch Fire as it's caught fire on Netflix, finally. And so they were very judicious about what project they chose next to tackle, although Chris Cantwell's been doing a lot of... He's writing Iron Man now for Marvel. Um, So that's really exciting. Why the Last Man? Maybe like Halo kind of feels like it should have happened already. Sure. And maybe missed its moment. Like it it was kind of a no-brainer because... It was a finite but extremely spread out story. I think it ran like 70, 80 issues and people probably at this point know, but it's about a mysterious event occurs and all the men in the world die. I believe it's because they tried to make liquor-based pan sauces simultaneously. (laughs) And the only survivors are the women who knew better. One brave mixologist named Yorick survives the event and then tries to figure out what the hell happened. Mm -hmm. And... FX has been just doggedly working this for so long. Yeah. Uh, they had an entire pilot, scrapped it, hired a new showrunner, did it again, then changed stars because uh, Barry Keough was the star, who you might remember from Dunkirk, no longer. So they had to reshoot that. I mean, good things come from messy development all the time, but both the development makes me a little nervous and then also, doesn't it kind of feel like a just kind of feels like a 25 2015 2016 2017 project that's a fascinating it's, point you know tv's ability to kind of move quickly if it's going to feel like it's at all um connected i mean we talked a lot about this a lot with like industry and and i may destroy you towards the end of the year about like television that feels like tv now like like life feels yes. now it doesn't necessarily have to be about the pandemic or about trump but kind of reflects experience now it's interesting to see these projects that have been in development for such a long time and whether or not like those things will still speak to us it's also interesting to me from a budgetary standpoint and maybe some of our old pals at fx who i know listen like like nick grad or eric schreier might want to either chime in anonymously in the email or just join us to talk about it at some point there does seem to be an appetite for expensive spectacle that is extremely limited right like something like station 11 can't be cheap 
I can't imagine they're planning a season two. They're going for it in one. And that's how people consume TV now. And that's understood. Why the Last Man, by nature, has to be expensive for three to six seasons, right? In order to tell the full story. That's just a different outlay on your investment. And I'm sure that, you know, no one is as smart as FX in terms of being aware of what they're doing and how they present it. So I'm sure they've crunched all the numbers and it makes sense for them to continue to pursue this. But we are in this world where like doing Lord of the Rings for half a billion dollars or whatever over many years, okay, that I could see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to watch it, but I could see it. Sure. This sort of feels like a tweener from a slightly different era that was really only like 18 months ago. Why don't we wrap it up there? I'll put up a, a list of all the shows that we talked about when we tweet out the episode. But, you know, there's Gilded Age, Julian Fellow Show, starring Christine Baranski with Carrie Coon. Very excited starring about who? that. Who? Christine Baranski with Carrie Coon. Can't uh, wait. You know, Daisy Jones and the Six, which is Michael Weber and Scott Neustadter's adaptation of a, a beloved book with it's Riley Keough and Sam Claffin. And it, it so, kind of sounds like Fleetwood Mac. It's basically it's a, rock a 70s novel, rock. Yeah. yeah. Brand New Cherry Flavor with Rosa Salazar and Catherine Keener about an aspiring film director in the sun-drenched but seamy world of 1990 Los Angeles. That comes from Nick Antosca as the producer and the pilot directed by my beloved Briar Patch director, Arkasha Stevenson. Can't oh, awesome. See that. Yeah, so yeah. And then obviously, you know, just waiting on House of the Dragon. Like that's that's also looming too. So we'll probably see stuff from that show this year. But with we Patty won't get Constantine, the show. Did we that's even right. talk about that? No, I mean that's, I think that's a twenty two show. So we have lots of stuff to talk about. Andy and I will be back on Thursday. Uh, we'll chat about the Facebook groups, the Watch Facebook groups, best of twenty twenty. But we're in twenty twenty one now, so we have a lot to talk about. I can't wait to t- see you on Thursday, man. We only look forward. Uh, that's right. Except for, we look back to Halo. That's all. Can we talk? Also, I just want to. I'm going to develop a working theory about why when the problem of the past was that the chicken was too wet, that you felt the need to add a pan sauce to the protein. Well, this this is a pork chop. No, I get it. But I just feel like, you know, liquidity seems to be, (laughs) shout out to industry, that seems to be the issue. You know what I mean? That's right. Well, we need something to talk about on Thursday. We could do it then. I can't wait. Can't wait. Happy New Year, Brains.